met uh, this time at Fort Carlton with the government officials, and they signed Treaty 4, which turned over the lands and uh, primarily the lakes and the north and uh, south Saskatchewan rivers uh, over to um, our government. And finally, 115 years ago, the Cree and Chippewan tribes met with our provincial officials at Ila La Crosse and they signed Treaty 10, which took, which gave us responsibility for the lands and lakes across the middle north of Saskatchewan. And this key word, I think, is responsibility. We were given or accepted the responsibility, not only for the lands, but also for the lakes be, with uh, those three treaties. And how do we accept responsibility? How do we show responsibility? Well, I think Joe's presentation today is all about responsible behavior, responsible behavior from local governments, from councils and and uh, uh, the uh, governing folks. And it is their job to pass laws and to set regulations to ensure that these lands and these lakes endure, that they are there for our children's children. And uh, I think the way they do that is to set a vision. That vision is called an official community plan. And to set the required laws, which are called the zoning bylaws. So we have the guru of OCPs and zoning bylaws with us. His name is Joe Joza. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Lynn. And welcome to the presentation using your planning bylaws to protect your uh, lake shore. The presentation will run for about uh, 40 to 45 minutes. And the presentation will start out with two main topics, the environmental imper imperative and the open space environment, which will lay the basis for the planning documents. So uh, what does the uh, environment mean? According to uh, the Environmental Management Protection Act, it lists a number of items. By the way, all these things will be recorded so you have access to all the overhead I'm using. So I only touch on highlights of the slides. So in the bottom it says for environment, the surrounds or conditions in which a person animal or plant lives or operates and the sustainable development is uh, according to the <clears throat> world commission on environment this development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs and this is by the World Commission on Environment and Development. And on top of that, the mission of the Brundtland Commission stated that to unite countries, in this case, you could say resort villages or RMs, to pursue sustainable development together, meaning cooperate. So, in short, sustainable means meeting present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And, and here is a even simpler presentation explanation for sustainable development. It is called responsible development, means the management of human relationships with the environment so that economic, social, and cultural needs are met and ecological processes and natural diversity are maintained. Boy, that's a, a mouthful. So now, about uh, community development, sustainable management, and so on, here is a quote from one of the community plans, sustainable management of open space area, natural environment. That is, the natural environment on the open space area would be managed sustainably, which is a prerequisite to the sustainable development, that is, the built area of the uh, resort village. So, in the resort communities, uh, 
perspective on the sustainable development that it has a vision and it's goal driven with the natural environment as one of the goals and it's evidence based based on facts and it is a balanced approach conservation and protection on one hand and development on the other hand and also it balances the interests of uh, rate payers and the decisions are understood in terms of the limitation on the natural and the uh, built environment and one of the other perspectives uh, for a resource community would be at the very least do no harm work toward reducing mitigating uh, concerns and also it is continually adjusting and it has public support behind it and i would like to say that it is also based on some precautionary principle because we don't have all the facts we are dealing with uncertainty uncertainty when an activity raises threats of human to human health or to the environment, precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established. This is sometimes that we uh, follow, say, in, in council meetings when we reach out to experts. And also with the uh, sustainable development, there are strategies to uh, work toward the goal, which is part of the uh, strategy of the overall plan. And the plan is implemented through your uh, village's sphere of influence. That is, could be intermunicipal uh, cooperation. Oops. So now, what is open space? To some, it is the nothing in between because it yields no tax revenue. And for others, it's a shorthand for environment. Actually, open spaces refer to all unsubdivided and dedicated lands, which are also unsubdivided within a resort village. And these open spaces have functions. Just for illustration, provide recreation opportunities on land and water, shoreland serve important protection, preservation, conservation, and village village shaping functions. That is where you de develop your uh, lot. And it sets the uh, atmosphere in the park-like setting for the resort village. So uh, where do we find these open spaces? Well, when you look at this chart, on the top, I have the natural open spaces and the built environment. And then below that, there is a functionality, as I mentioned before, about the functionality of uh, open spaces. And then there are on the right side, development districts under the built environment. And going back to the uh, functionality, some of these lands are designated as dedicated lands, buffer strips, natural environment reserve, public reserve, and so on. And even on private lots, there are open spaces because of the uh, limit on footprint that you can develop. So there are open spaces uh, that are worth to uh, pay attention to on both on the natural and the built environment. Under the natural open spaces for example there are drainage ways floodways and because of all these things minimum building elevations have to be addressed so what are the uh, benefits of uh, protecting environment in a resort community there are the natural benefits for example habitat protection land and fresh habitat protection. There are some social benefits and community health and well-being benefits, which we have experienced during the shutdown and COVID, where we go outside for fresh air and so on. And of course, there are the economic benefits. 
where you have well looked after over open spaces, the property values go up. And then also uh, just the way the open spaces are managed, you could realize some savings from maintaining natural conditions. And of course, these open spaces, some would be buffers would protect the property from natural hazards. So the next slide, I propose to elevating environmental considerations to the level of conventional infrastructure considerations. Wow, that's a mouthful. What I'm suggesting is treat open space environment at the same serious, with the same seriousity, with the same respect as you would uh, uh, treat uh, conventional infrastructure like road, water, and sewer. And because you have to uh, look at the open space in a sustainable way so that it helps the uh, functioning of the community. Some of the municipalities use watershed, grow, uh, watershed goals at the lot and block subdivision level, which means that they pay attention right at the uh, subdivision level to open spaces because the water eventually lands out in the lake. So I suggest to elevate the environmental considerations from amenity to green infrastructure, infrastructure consideration in the land use policy. And some examples of these infrastructure, infrastructure things are, say, under natural filters like village forest tree plantation, and so on. And uh, still about elevating the uh, environmental considerations at par with the conventional infrastructures. Effective control of green infrastructure could be built into the uh, concept plan right before the subdivision design starts in advancing so that when it comes to commenting on the subdivision development that the uh, village receives from community planning, you could say, okay, well, what are the uh, drainage trails, open spaces? We don't want to have too many ditches and so on. We want to have the development fit the land. And of course, also on these plans, uh, there would be tentatively dedicated lands identified and some would function as filters. And of course, there is another control that comes into play with this development is when you apply for development, um, you would uh, ask for what was that they have considered for um, open spaces. Here, I, I show a, a slide, a poll from which wanted you to uh, look at to pick the top three things that you feel are of common issue to your cottage community. Unfortunately, because of production complexities in here, I can only speak to these uh, eight points. So would the issue be one of the common issues in your village would be need for guidelines on the public use of uh, municipal reserves, uh, uh, shoreline reserves, say for moorings, docks, boat lifts, personal watercraft, and other shoreline structures. Number two, uh, would you have any unauthorized environment or unauthorized use of environmental reserves or shoreline development like beach improvement, landscaping, erosion control? Because you need a, a permit for that from the authorities. Well, would drainage be and flooding be a, an issue because of lack of floodplain zoning? And is there a need for a ground cover management uh, to control erosion? Would you have any water quality issues? And uh, would you need inspection of sewage holding tanks, for example? Are there any issues with both in uh, traffic and beach safety? Another one, the last one is, uh, do you have an official community plan zoning bylaw or if you don't, is that, would that be out of date or not? So, so far, I covered 
em, em, importance of environment and the open space environment. Now I'll be moving on to the planning documents, which really start trying to explore how planning bylaws offer a way to protect the lake and the, and so on. In that sense, I have four main topics in here, the re regulatory environment, spheres or areas of influence that of the resort village, planning bylaws, like the official community plan and zoning bylaw, and also uh, statements of provincial interest regulations. Under the regulatory, regulatory environment, we have the Planning and Development Act and the number of regulations under the Planning and Development. And one, as I mentioned, the Statement of Provincial Interest Regulations, Subdivision Regulations, and Dedicated Lands. So, so much for the dedicated, I should say, the regulatory environment. Now, let's look at the spheres of influence. A hypothetical lake, two resort villages, an arm on either side of the lake, regional park on the top, and an Indian reserve. I am just showing this to raise the question, what would be the resort villages uh, sphere of influence? Would it be uh, just the village itself? Or would there be some sort of a cooperation amongst all these other entities because the environmental uh, concerns in the Cottage Lakes, uh, there must be uh, concerns of common interest to all the uh, participants. So the solution I have heard from previous uh, presenters before is cooperate and cooperate. So now let's just get into the uh, official community plans. Both the uh, OCP and the zoning bylaw I referred to must have a content as uh, prescribed by the Planning and Development Act and the process for issuing uh, uh, development permits and the process for assessing the expectations of the community and the purpose of the official community plan is to provide a policy framework to guide the physical, environmental, economic and so on development in the village. And the purpose of the zoning bylaw is to control the use of land for providing for the uh, amenity of the resort village for the health, safety, and general welfare of the inhabitants. The uh, Planning Act spells out the, the content of the official community plan. First of all, it says the OCP must incorporate statements of provincial interest as far as it's practical. So hold that thought. Then, then the next one is an OCP must contain statements of policy with respect to, now this is the resort village area on sustainable current and future land use. I just highlighted some of the topics that would be uh, germane to our presentation. The management of lands that are subject to natural hazards, flooding and so on. Management of environmentally sensitive lands, source water protection, and then moving on to uh, coordination of land use uh, with adjacent municipalities. So when you looked at, at the diagram about the spheres of influence, for example, this would speak to that one. And then also the official community plan may address coordination of municipal program, programs related to development and contain statements of policy regarding the use of dedicated lands. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider in here. Also, within the Planning and Development Act, when it comes to uh, development, temporary development, it is called on dedicated lands. This can be affected through a permit, that is to uh, 
set up a boat dock or a personal watercraft, or in fact, uh, shoreline improvement, beach improvement, erosion control, for that, you need an agreement. So, in other words, the official community plan is a policy framework for decision on environmental sustainability. By now, I should stress, I am only addressing the environmental side of things toward the lake and along the lake shore. There are other aspects to official community plan. So I keep emphasizing that the policy and the vision would uh, keep the uh, protection of the environment throughout the village. And it would uh, have infrastructure with green infrastructure matched. And without the official uh, community plan, the village has no control over the development or coordinate services and capital planning, nor uh, separate incomparable uses or uh, protect uh, development from uh, hazards. So we heard about the uh, official community plan. The zoning bylaw is the one that really puts the wheels under the OCP. The policy statements in the OCP through the zoning bylaw become the law, that is the zoning bylaw regulations. So it controls the use and development of the land and sets out land use districts or zones. And the examples of these zones, I just call them base zones, like commercial, residential, recreation, environmental reserves, and so on. And on top of these zones, there are overlay zones depending on some concerns. For example, flood hazard zone with special regulations. Uh, these uh, overlay zones would trump some of the regulations under the base zone. For example, uh, with the special regulations, it might state certain things about foundation, or building elevation that would have to be built in if that building is within the flood zone area, or to deal with heritage overlay, which is lately very important when community plans get reviewed. So, and also the zoning bylaw regulates uh, protection of groundwater, stormwater management, removal of sand, excuse me, and gravel, tree cutting, and uh, discretionary land uses and it also establishes the rules for the subdivision of land and for example regulating the maximum site area of a residential lot and then also the establishing procedure for obtaining development permits so what happens if there is an impasse even though we have all these documents For example, a community could be torn apart, take two sides on a particular development project issue. Well, a council could strike a committee to review all or part of the existing OCP and the zoning bylaw, discuss the pros and the cons of options keeping or changing some, some parts of the bylaw because maybe uh, the bylaw may need to be amended, or maybe there's a misunderstanding about it. And of course, uh, finding a third way, or the prevail that is uh, getting a prevailing common sense and convince the naysayers. And, up, and in some cases, this whole thing could be elevated right up to public hearing. So, don't forget that the zoning bylaw is the uh, the means of implementing the official plan uh, policies. And when it comes to the environmental policies of the community plan, it must be incorporated into the zoning bylaw to become an official policy. Otherwise, statements about the environment are meaningless unless they are addressed in the zoning bylaw. 
And here I'll just uh, move one uh, uh, quote uh, from a subdivision regulations, just to show you that uh, there are some fairly uh, specific guidelines in protecting the environment. I'm just drawing your attention to say there is no subdivision within 1500 meters of, a, of the intake for a water treatment plant, plant or a 457 meters of a landfill for disposal of garbage and refuse and so on. So now we move on to the statements of provincial interest regulations. These came into being in 2012 and there are 16 statements of provincial interest that may be applicable helpful to counsel at the village level for policies and regulations to protect the lake, lakeshore, and so on. And I have listed all 16, but I'm not going to go in, into them. But for example, some are very obvious, like sand and gravel removal, shoreland and water bodies, source water protection, and I refer to heritage and culture, intermunicipal cooperation, public safety, uh, public works, water and sewage, and uh, so on. Now, so we have the statement of provincial interests. How do the uh, planning bylaws that we just talked about, the official community plan and the zoning bylaw relate to these? Well, first of all, the statement of provincial interests are the uh, benchmark in reviewing new official community plans, district plans, which I didn't talk about. That district plan could probably apply around that leg that I showed you in the diagram on the spheres of influence, zoning bylaws and, and subdivision bylaws, the so-called planning bylaws. And approving authorities that approve subdivisions, like in cities, uh, villages come under the province, are responsible for ensuring consistency with the uh, statements of interest, say, during the subdivision approval process. Now, I got this out of the planning handbook, which I referenced also in the back of my presentation. And also we have the planning handbook. Handbook. It's an interim draft. It's not a regulation, but it is a companion document to the, I call it the SPI, Statement of Provincial Interest Regulations. It guides the preparation of planning bylaws documents, especially on a complex set of issues. And uh, it, I found it a very useful tool to ensure that we haven't overlooked important things, for example, like, oops, like First Nations uh, consultation and uh, heritage resource screening. In addition to the uh, statement of provincial interest and the planning handbook, we also refer to the planning principles, which actually is part of the SPR regulations. The idea under these eight principles that I am showing to you is to assure that the interests of all community members are represented when it comes to coming up with planning documents and arriving at decisions. So it's a very useful, for example, cooperative and proactive. Uh, you would expect and research certain things that the village may be f facing. For example, there may be some development proposed on the lake elsewhere or between two subdivisions, like on the east side of uh, Last Mon Lake. And the inclusive, it would include all the interested parties. So, I showed you the planning documents. Now we arrived at the place where we discuss the protection 
of the environment. See, I emphasized earlier that this presentation is really lakeside, the lakeshore, shoreland oriented. So I came up with 11 points. I'll back up again. Environmental stewardship. Now, there are some explanations for these later on. Stormwater management, already have alluded to it. Source water and groundwater protection, water conservation, climate change, subdivision, site development, and the shoreland development and temporary structures, hazard lands, intermunicipal co cooperation, and uncertainties. Under environmental stewardship, uh, these would be addressed if they are applicable in the OCP and the zoning bylaw, like on green spaces, trees, grasses, plantations, landscaping, tree uh, protection, management and maintenance practices, fire protection, noxious weeds, and so on. And under soil water management, uh, already re related to uh, green infrastructure, regulated driveways, the uh, use of swales, slope overlay, source water protection, aquifer protection overlay, sewage system holding tank checks. This would be going, uh, would be addressed if they're applicable in the OCP and the zoning bylaw if they need to be regulated or say, discourage use of pesticides, herbicides, and road salts, storage of hazardous chemi chemicals, and also on the source water protection, there will be some opportunity for intermunicipal cooperation. I'll just move on to, with the other slides, the water conservation drought climate change, for example, <clears throat> would address, <clears throat> excuse me, water-wise landscaping bylaws, change tolerant, drought tolerant um, trees. Uh, examples would be in the water wise landscaping that you would set a turf limit, how, how much you would irrigate on a lot <clears throat> and define the kind of vegetation coverage you would require. Hopefully you would use native plants. And in some cases, like in the South, you would promote uh, dryland landscaping, seriescaping but it would still require the lot owner to look after the proper proper way, look after the property. And when it comes to subdivision development, I want to emphasize a, a few key points. In the Planning Act, on the section 44, it refers to uh, consent, concept plans. This is kind of a prelude to subdividing and developing an area of land. And the points I want to raise again in here is keep an eye on the green infrastructure where you can use green leverage that would be factored into the infrastructure in the subdivision concept plan. And also, I just would caution you, don't sign up for sub on a subdivision approval, say, if you're referred to with the subdivision plan from the approving authorities until you have a servicing agreement. And make sure that there is public access to the lake. Now, on this note, public access to the lake, when it comes to dedicated lands, don't go for any trade-offs for land that would need to be recognized for a uh, dedicated land, land along the lake shore or some other land further away from the lake. Stick with the layout and have people access to the lake shore and also provide protection of the lake shore environment. And of course, there are some other checks and balances. For example, when it comes to reviewing uh, development proposals, uh, most zoning bylaws call for landscaping plan. So subdivision development and site development is a key point where you can 
control and affect environmental considerations and also protect public good. Now, and here is another uh, slide on the development and temporary structures, coral modifications like erosion, beach improvement, improvement, and so on. These require agreement. But first, you would have to check with the environmental authorities. Uh, and uh, temporary shoreline structures where you would have moorings, uh, boat lifts, and so on, those would require a permit. These you would have to research, but you would address in the uh, official community plan and the zoning bylaw. And I just have a diagram in here about say this line up and down is where the high water mark is up from it that's where the village area is and below it is the bed of the lake and it's a crown land and that area when you put out docks piers boatlets and so on or called shoreline structures you need a permit you talk to your uh, municipal office in most cases there is an understanding between environment sask environment or maybe it could be agriculture that the village office handles the uh, permits and when it comes to a lakeside lakeside development that would be by agreement like beach improvement and so on erosion control or, or building a boat launch even the village would have to get a, a review from the authorities. The rest are some other points of interest like dedicated lands and so on, but the key message in here along the lake side, lake side lands is that you need shoreline structure permits and lakeside development agreements. And the purpose of these is to, in some ways, safeguard the environment along the lake and also the riparian uh, fish habitat areas and of course there are the good neighbor features this would be addressed in the zoning bylaw for example in some cases it could be by the municipal bylaw like encroachment onto dedicated lands noise dark skies dogs on leash and uh, tree removal from the village first and so on, and safe boating and the wake boats. And hazardous lands, we talked about it. The important thing is to establish the minimum building elevation if you are in a flood, way, flood zone. And uh, the management of sensitive lands and environmental reserves in some ways, I have already alluded with the uh, lakeside development and modifications. And the, the allowable, allowable uses would be also established on the environmental reserve, would be identified in the uh, zoning bylaw and the protection and the maintenance practices that you would follow. And uh, there may be a need for a seasonal protection overlay zone which is for example could apply to a critical nesting habitat like the uh, along lake Dave and baker the uh, certain uh, migratory birds have their uh, nesting during the spring so that the village wouldn't allow any bikes or quads along the lake shore that is on the sand and this is just a cross-section of lakeside land, like you have the cottages and you have the municipal reserve or environmental reserve below that. And this could be owned by the municipality or the crown. And then you have this bank or boundary of the lake below that the lake bed is owned by the crown here the municipality would issue temporary 
permits, and this doesn't mention um, agreements in consultation with the authorities, but that may require a review by environment, uh, fisheries and oceans, for example, and there may be other authorities. So this brings us to intermunicipal cooperation on solid waste and sewage disposal. These things cost a lot of money, so that it would make sense to uh, cooperate. Source water protection is very important because the water doesn't uh, go by uh, village boundaries and it goes downhill into the lake. So we have to protect the quality of the lake. And the uh, aquifer protection is also very important. So is fire protection, emergency measures, and often lake capacities become an issue in terms of the biological carrying capacity of the lake and then also the public safety aspect. Some uh, advanced uh, resort villages like Candle Lake, for example, have examined, studied the capacities of the lake. It's an important thing to keep an eye on. And of course, uh, uh, there are on environmental uncertainties. These are dealing with unknowns. This is what I mentioned earlier that you would reach out for professional opinion. And of course, as common sense would suggest, you would ask some questions. Is this potentially hazardous? And also look for causes and consequences on things that are being considered. And then also ask questions like, uh, are there less hazardous options available, for example, to herbicides, pesticides, or cleaners? And also, what was the experience? How did others uh, deal with some issues? So anyway, I just want to remind us to follow the precautionary principle. It's better to be safe than sorry. So. We pretty well covered all the things that have to do with protecting the lakeshore community. Now, I just want to get into briefly uh, getting started on your uh, planning process. Uh, you could draw up your own list, but first of all, you have to organize as highly recommended that council establishes a planning committee or a reference committee and invite others in on the committee or the work task force and do a preliminary assessment of things. And I highly recommend to get hold of the planning handbook because it identifies a number of things that should be taken into consideration. And uh, knowing the lay of the land, you would identify the natural, scenic, and so on, resources that would need protecting. And you would also learn from other authorities. There could have been some studies, even by universities. Important thing before you undertake any uh, tinkering with uh, policy statements and uh, copying zoning bylaw statements is, in your own way, determine the long-term vision and goals for the resort community around the environment. Of course, there are other goals to consider, for example, providing uh, accommodations. Sorry about that. And you would establish the planning issues information. This is where you would need people to work with. Then you, you have done your homework to some extent, then you start to gather some information and also look at the statement of provincial interest, they may have some suggestions too. And you will arrive at what the opportunities and the constraints are. And then you would put together a draft document for the OCP and the zoning bylaw and go to public hearing. And uh, good luck on that one. So I just want to relate to the uh, applying the planning handbook now. The interests are provincial interests that I refer to, and also the Planning and Development Act content identifies that there are some interests that need to be addressed at the village level. So you look at these things and see if uh, 
the statement of provincial interest is applicable in your situation. So you look at the context, the appropriateness of the information to the local interest. And then the uh, planning handbook also has some implement implementation guidance on each of the 16 interests. You may find this also useful to uh, draft your own implementation guidance at the local level. So, and then also the handbook raises the questions, what does the municipality need to know? And what the consider, what council may wish to consider? And it also says the planning document should include uh, permitted and discretionary land uses relevance to the municipality and the area that is the document is relevant and uh, establish requirements for land use and operation and then the implementation strategies so you would find the planning handbook very useful in getting ready to do your community planning so now how do you keep the uh, the process the planning process on track a council has a variety of measures through from public participation to implementing process with the help of the official community plan and the zoning bylaw and there may be in some cases environmental audits and of course being visible what you're doing volunteerism will also keep your feet to the fire to make sure that you follow your own official community plan and zoning bylaw and very important in the lake community is that you partner and cooperate with your, your neighboring uh, municipalities and other entities so i covered a lot and i drank a bit of water i just want to remind you that I talked about the importance of the open space environmental environment and that make sure that the environment receives the same respect as your uh, general infrastructure. I went into the planning bylaws, a lot of things to keep an eye on. Important thing is you involve the public. And when it comes to development, invite or let the developer know that you want to see them with the concept plan where you can keep an eye on some of the environmental green infrastructure items and also make sure there are no trade-offs of uh, dedicated land along the lake shore for land for further away from the lake. And also make sure that you have a service agreement in place before you sign off on the subdivision plan. And I also went into the main questions that should be addressed to protect the lake and the lake shore in your community. So, and I also stressed the importance, just like previous presenters, the need for cooperation, intermunicipal cooperation. And here I am listing some references that I have used. And these you will have access to just as the overall overhead document uh, from parks. And uh, these are other sources of information that I found useful information. And for example, the uh, watershed protection plan, plan for the North Saskatchewan watershed. There were some good observations that I have relied on several times but it was applicable to other conditions. So I suggest that you look at other watershed plans also. And uh, thank you for your participation and uh, bearing with me. Thanks very much, Joe. That was, that was an excellent overview of community planning with environment in mind. Um, so we'll move now on to the uh, question period. So if you would like to ask Joe a question, just raise your hand 
uh, and I'll unmute you and you can talk to Joe or type a question within the question box and uh, I'll read it out. So uh, if you have any questions, um, please do so. So I have a question here, Joe. Uh, who controls roadways connecting to neighboring villages for their protection? The uh, roadways, um, well, they, they're registered with the Department of Highways, say a grid road, but the grid road itself is controlled by the municipality or, or the local authority, say if it is just a village road but it has to follow certain requirements spelled out in the Highways Act. But for practicality like maintenance and so on, it's the local government's responsibility. So we have another question. Um, Water quality seems to be a, a big topic discussion currently uh, based on uh, a lot of the information coming out how climate change and new nutrient loading are, are affecting our lakes. Um, can you talk community plans can, can control new water protection? Nutrient loading or source water? Uh, could you repeat that, uh, Chuck? Yeah, so um, you had mentioned uh, uh, you, there's zoning bylaws that you can put in place. And if a resort village or community was concerned about nutrient loading, uh, whether it be, say, from septic tanks or runoff into the lake, uh, how can a resort community go about controlling that? Okay, uh, just let's take the, uh, the sewage lagoon, the holding tank uh, question. And then after that, I'll answer another question in terms of the runoff from other sources into the lake, like from uh, herbicides, pesticides, and so on. Uh, we try to have a uh, health authority to say, well, Check these uh, septic tanks because uh, they suspect. And the health authority mentioned the only way we will check these uh, holding tanks if you covered the, the need in your zoning bylaw. So you just can't just ask health. They need to fall back on some official uh, request that the village is behind it. So I highly recommend that you put that into your uh, zoning bylaw. And uh, uh, the inspection of these holding tanks could be established at the local level according to your own criteria. It could be by uh, drawing a number or uh, there could be some telltale signs. Now, the other question I would say, like for runoffs into the lake, this is where it's so important that I emphasize the, uh, the natural infrastructure, uh, the buffer between the lake and the development that you would intercept the runoff, that it wouldn't go straight into the lake, but it would settle inside the village. So don't dig any ditches right down to the lake just so that the water leaves the village as fast as the, the raindrop hits the ground. It's important that you establish a, a buffer, and I think, uh, one of the previous presenters uh, uh, also referred to the importance of these uh, natural buffers because they work. Uh, using the uh, concept plan, for example, I noticed that uh, 
on the old uh, subdivision plans, it's all the lots follow the lake shore. And then some of the public reserves, well, there are some along the lake shore, but most of the uh, public reserves were put onto areas that are away from the lake shore. Well, first of all, I don't think it's a good investment strategy from the developer's point of view because with this shoreline development, what happens to the land on the other side of the road? It makes it less desirable. So you keep growing with your development along the lake shore. A solution to that is you establish clusters, uh, different layouts, and also pull the cottage lots back from the rim of the lake so that you have sufficient buffer between the lake and the development. That's it. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Uh, we got another question here. Is there a limit to the amount of development allowed on a lake? That is a drinking water lake for a huge area, considering fishing, recreation, etc. I am uh, not aware of it. It's a very good question. I think that the limit would be, and this is so important that you monitor the uh, quality, the, the lake water. And this was stressed by a previous presenter uh, during uh, session two, uh, Dr. Levitt. So it is something that people don't like to spend money on, but it would be a good idea for the uh, entities, resort villages around the lake that would get together. Uh, I don't know if the province uh, has the uh, lake quality monitored as they used to do in the past, but that needs to be done. It's a good investment. And if something happens, just like in these days uh, when you have endemic after endemic, uh, blue algae and so on, you have an early warning system. Anyway, it's not an easy solution. I'm not aware of any lakes that would have any limits on it other than up by um, Humboldt uh, that seems to make the uh, news every year during the spring run-up. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. Just one last uh, opportunity. If someone has a question, please raise your hand or type something in the question box. Um, and just a reminder, uh, next week is the last Lake Water Wednesday webinar of the season. And it, as I mentioned at the start, it will be a panel discussion. Uh, I don't think you, know, you wanna miss this one. It's gonna involve a number of experts uh, talking about some of the things that were discussed in the previous webinars and sort of bringing it all together and then having an opportunity to discuss as a panel at the end. So uh, not seeing any more questions, I will turn it back over to Lynn for final comments. Hi, can you folks hear me? Yes. Yeah. Whoopsie, I lost. Uh, question one, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, then I will do nothing else. I want to really thank Joe. And, and my way of thanking Joe, ladies and gentlemen, is to tell you two very, very quick anecdotes. One shows stupidity and one shows wisdom. The first one happened to me a couple of years ago, and I was speaking to a member of a resort village council. And that member was saying to me, you know, they want you to have an official community plan, and uh, we can't afford that. So we figured out what to do. We went and borrowed one from the little uh, the, the little city down the road, because uh, our brother-in-law had a coffee, and uh, we copied most of it and called that our official community plan. So that's my bad news stupidity example. 
I don't know what, a little city and a, and a, um, a, a cottage community have much in common. And uh, as Joe has emphasized, when you make an official community plan, you make your vision for the way you want your community to be. After telling you that dumb statement, I want to tell you a very clever thing I learned just recently. Just recently, I uh, uh, was told that the newest resort village in Saskatchewan, which is the resort village of Turtle View on Turtle Lake, I had heard that they are in the process of developing their official community plan and zoning bala, and they've hired Joe Joza to help them do it. I think that's a smart thing. And it might mean a few extra dollars along the way, although Joe isn't expensive, but I'll tell you, investing in good plans really, really helps you go in good directions. So I leave you with those two comparisons and thank you all for coming and a special thanks to Joe for sharing his wisdom. Thank you very much.